March 13th, 1990. A small rural town in north central Kansas is settling down for a normal Tuesday night. The farmers are working the fields, the wives are cooking dinner, and the kids are doing schoolwork. Nothing seems out of the ordinary until sirens sound the air. In the early hours of March 12th, upper air maps indicate a high pressure area over the southeastern United States and a low pressure area across western portions of the country. Southwesterly flow across the Rocky Mountains indicate that the air is right for supercells. A jet stretching from southern Texas into Iowa fuels moisture from the Gulf of Mexico into the Great Plains. The moisture becomes entrenched in the warm sector of the low pressure area to the east of a well-defined dry line stretching from western Texas into western Kansas. At 6 a.m. near Heston, a pool of convective available potential energy indicates a strong instability in the atmosphere. In response to these readings, the National Weather Service issues a broad moderate risk for severe weather across a majority of the Great Plains. During the afternoon, a complex of towering cumulus and developing cumulonimbus form. These clouds go on to produce several tornadoes in Nebraska. The outflow boundary in south central Kansas holds steady. A small storm forms 100 miles southwest of Heston. At first, the storm is weak, but as new updraft towers form on the southwest flank of the storm, it begins to intensify. The storm now begins to move northeast. Storm chaser Kevin Darmafall is on K96 near Hutchinson when he notices the storm on radar. Since it's the only storm at the time, he decides to pursue it. A developing wall cloud begins to form as golf ball sized hail starts to rain down on the vehicle, and in a couple of minutes, a tornado touches down near Pretty Prairie, heading right towards the storm chasers. They think about moving their vehicle, but decide to stay put and continue taking pictures. They see multiple vortices at the base of the tornado and are close enough to hear the tornado. It doesn't sound like a normal tornado, it sounds more like a waterfall of wind, different from normal tornadoes. The tornado comes less than three quarters of a mile away before the storm chasers lose sight of the tornado. As the tornado continues northeast, it claims its first victim. A six-year-old boy from the town of Burton is crushed by a chimney while surrounded by his family. The tornado approaches Heston, and a group of students are watching it at Heston College. They observe the tornado in awe, watching it stay still and grow slightly bigger. It is headed right for them, and right for downtown Heston. Lucky for them, just east of the tornado, a rare phenomenon called a microburst occurs. This causes the tornado to swerve a quarter mile to the north, causing the tornado to no longer track towards downtown Heston. The microburst also makes the tornado shrink in size. Unfortunately, this also causes winds inside the tornado to strengthen to incredible speeds, making it much more dangerous for those on the northeastern portion of the town. Kirk Olliman, the president of Heston College, is right in the path of a tornado. His house is completely annihilated. The tornado rages on, heading straight for the Heston machine and welding warehouse, which sustains a direct hit, reducing it to rubble. A mile and a half east of the town, Dean Allison is in a pristine location to film a tornado. Here, he captures the most famous video of the tornado. You'll notice debris from the warehouses flying through the air, which causes the tornado to become pitch black. At the same time, Carol Pierce is on the side of Heston Road when she snaps a picture of the tornado. As the tornado continues, Croft Lumber and Kink Construction take a direct hit from the tornado. Many homes on North Main Street are also destroyed. On East Lincoln Boulevard, the Pizza Hut suffers a direct hit. This is the story of Jason Shafe, who was inside the Pizza Hut at the time of the tornado. I was joking and having fun with my counterpart as we made pizzas up to the last minute. As I was topping a pepperoni pizza, my managers came in and told us to get in the walk-in freezer. My fellow cook mentioned that it sounded like a train, and so we made a train horn sound and joked around. Then it hit, and everybody was quiet, 
except for a few lady customers who were screaming some gibberish. Glass was shattering, debris was flying around and bouncing off the Pizza Hut like it was a pinball machine. Finally, after a few seconds, it was over. Everybody inside the walk-in decided to walk out, and that's when I noticed a damage to the Pizza Hut. The front end of the building was gone, and all the cars were either gone or destroyed. As the tornado exits Heston, something incredible happens. A second tornado forms a mile to the east of the original one. The second tornado quickly intensifies as the Heston tornado becomes weaker. They draw closer, with the Heston tornado orbiting the rapidly strengthening tornado. John Wright, a reporter from KFDI, is watching the tornado live. And the tornado is now apparently moving toward the north and east right now. There are some businesses at that location, a Pizza Hut. If you're at that Pizza Hut, you have to get to a place of safety right now. It is going to move across a service station in just a matter of moments. And uh, this uh, tornado is twisting, turning. And we have now another funnel cloud that has formed. Uh, we have two, one tornado. We have two tornadoes on the ground here now. Two, one over by the Heston College that is getting closer. The other just about a mile and a half away from the parent cloud. So we now have two tornadoes that are on the ground, not just one. So folks over in the north and east part of Harvey County now should take shelter. It is about ready to go over the I-135 interstate right where I was parked a few moments ago. It is very quickly moving and uh, across, it's across the highway now. And if anyone was up there, uh, Lord only knows where they are now. There's debris that's just flying about the air. And now, the two tornadoes are engulfed in one huge cloud. I can't see both tornadoes. I can see just one huge cloud. I cannot see both tornadoes. And there's just debris scattered, debris scattered for miles. There's chunks of wood, metal, and apparently these uh, two tornadoes now are doing damage to the uh, area of a, a, a rest. A rest area just north and now west of Heston. This is this is uh, quite a sight here. Uh, people over in the, the uh, west, eastern part of Harvey County, now eastern part of Heston, should uh, take precaution to get to where you need to be right now. This new tornado continues northeast towards the town of Gossel and is much more intense than the first one. The tornado kills an elderly woman returning home from a visit to her ill husband. Because the tornado occurs over mostly rural areas, there is little footage or documentation of it, aside from this photo taken when the tornadoes merged. The damage caused by this tornado is described as Extreme F5 by the National Weather Service, and Ted Fujita, the person who created the Enhanced Fujita Scale, says that the Gossel tornado is the most intense tornado he ever studied, and other groups called it one of the most violent tornadoes in documented history with wind speeds of up to 315 miles per hour. Storm chaser Randy Steadham said, As the hook echo began to take shape, we began receiving a steady flow of eyewitness reports about that tornado and its location. The urgency of these personal accounts as received by phone and heard over the national warning system loudspeaker made it obvious we were dealing with a large and incredibly dangerous tornado. In the end, the Heston supercell produced five tornadoes, causing over $25 million in damage. Debris was found as far as 150 miles away from Heston. Two people were killed and more than 200 homes and businesses were destroyed. Today, Heston looks like any other town, with parks, college, and many houses dotted across the town. However, the scars of the Heston tornado remain in the trees and in the hearts and minds of those who went through it.